Uh, happy Friday, everybody. I'm Nick Slavic. I'm the proprietor of the Nick Slavic Painting and Restoration Company. I'm also the host of this show, Ask a Painter Live. It's a weekly live Facebook show where I use my over two decades of experience in this trade, in this craft, to answer any questions, which we're going to be doing later. Uh, I got an awesome special guest here, fellow Minnesota painter, feather, fellow Gathering of Minnesota Painters member, Adam Weinzell. Hi, everybody. JMJ Painting mm -hmm. and Chan Hassan. Chan Hassan. Yeah, and we're going to get into your story and all that. And uh, But first, the great and powerful Chris Shank. He comes with knowledge, with muscles, with perspective. <laughs> we're going to pop him on the screen, and he has the contractor question of the week. Chris Shank. Look at that. You look smart. I'm trying my best to look so smart right now. <laughs> we, should, we should we should say this first. The PCA Expo, your expo, is in days. Yeah, we are really excited, and we are really busy, and really distracted. <laughs> um, we do. We have a lot going on. This is going to be very different this year. Man, yesterday I heard that Marsha signed up like 25 people. Just people calling in, just calling in, be like, oh, I haven't registered for the expo yet. And, you know, our numbers are just better than ever, higher than last year. Uh, we are, there's a lot of challenges though this year. We got workshops that are going to be going on. We got a new keynote format. So at the very opening session, we've got like four different keynotes that are presenting about the workshops. And it is, it's just going to be moving pretty quickly. So a lot to do, a lot of excitement, a lot of buzz about it. But yeah, we're excited for sure. Well, the exposition, as I like to call it, I'm a traditionalist, happens next week, uh, generally midweek to late week, and it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of the finest paint business owner, craftspeople, painters in, in the United States. And um, in trying to summarize something like the exposition, uh, the after my first one, everything good happened to me. So if that's if that's any indication of like the worth of something like this and the, and the caliber of humans there, it's worth it. Well, we're, we're happy that you say something like that and we're happy that you're going to be there. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah, it ought to be good, right? Because you're helping to lead it. So it better be good. That's right. And I'm coming hot with content, Chris Shank. So <laughs> I believe it. Right. I believe it. We should get to the contractor question of the week. Okay, let's do it. So the contractor question of the week is, what do you do about drug testing? Um, so is marijuana use a problem or is it a perk of working with Nick Slavic? <laughs> oh, yeah, we get it out at every, every Monday morning. So. <laughs> no, uh, Adam, um, you're, you're starting up a paint business, have started up a paint business. Have you crossed this bridge? What do you do? What are your thoughts generally? Yeah, so we've, um, we have a outlined in our our painter contract essentially um, use of drugs and alcohol especially not on the premises um, always not on the premises um, we have gotten a call or two from clients saying i'm not really sure uh but there's a bottle in the back of the truck and so uh, we always yeah, want to yeah. make sure that we address that with our guys because not on the job um of course it's an illegal substance so we don't go so far as to do drug testing but we background check yeah. our guys just to make sure that we don't have poor records or at least we've got a stream of um, of good behavior for you know over a decade is usually what we're looking for so um, not something that we've had to deal with too much thankfully but something that we want to deal with in a preventative manner as opposed to reactive agreed uh, and have said all those intelligent things I don't do anything so it's it's one of west over here man bring what you got do what you want no I mean, we, you know that I have a organic way of handling a lot of these things. Like we practice the decent human being theory, which is there's two to three hurdles that are set up in front of people before they can get into my company. And as a byproduct of those hurdles, it, it does, it does weed out a lot of things that would, uh, uh, people and things that would not allow people to do the job as well as they could. So having said that, I'm sure it happens. Um, it's never been an issue. It has affected anything we've done. There's never any indication. And a testament to that is I think we have three people who smoke cigarettes in my company. And I say that because I've maybe caught them once. You can't smell it. You never see it. You don't know what goes on. And with everything else like that, if it's not an issue, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. If people do illegal things, 
that's illegal. That's not my purview. That's just against the law. But other than that, address it when it's an issue, right? Is, um, is pot legal around you guys? No. Um, I think it's like super strict medical maybe, yeah, medicinal but it's, it's not California medical where, you know, you stub your toe and you can, you know, have a pot farm. Yeah. So that's <laughs> not, uh, so I'm sure it will be, I'm sure we'll have to deal with it, but honestly, it's something I don't even think about. Now, the, the only other thing, uh, that I know that I've gotten the advice from is, uh, if you drug test somebody, if you background test somebody, you now have to drug test and background test everybody because otherwise that's discrimination. So uh, if you're going to do this, you can't just drug test the glassy eyed people. Mm -hmm. You have to do everybody. Otherwise it is discrimination. <laughs> that goes for your contract as well, especially if you have a contract for those of you who do, you need to make sure that you are abiding by the contract as it's written for everybody. Because if you give somebody leniency or you don't abide by it, or you take it, and this goes with, can go with clients as well. Yep. If you're not going to abide by the contract, somebody can really easily call that discrimination and that can be a, a right. big down. Chris, how much pot do you smoke? What? What? <laughs> that's, not, that's not funny. First of all, let's let's just cover we, this. We, you're a clean living guy, Christian. Nobody can be as smart as you uh, by inhibiting their senses. So. <laughs> Um, here's the thing, though. I, I don't hear a lot of conversation about this whole topic. And as uh, weed is, is legalized in more and more places, uh, I'm just kind of curious to what more and more contracts. It'd be interesting to see some comments come through about it. And um, yeah. because it's not that people aren't smoking anywhere. You know, it, it happens just about everywhere. But I wonder what the increase would be in those places where it is legal and how that affects painting businesses and their policies and um, everybody has a go different way of going about it. So, well, thanks for sharing guys. I really appreciate it. Absolutely, man. And, and uh, knowledge bomb for us, deep thought today, Chris Shank, or is your head 100% in expo? <laughs> <laughs> I want to, I want to pass on it today, guys, because my brain, I've got expo in my brain. I'm smoking expo. <laughs> Chris is high on expo. <laughs> that might count as this deep thought. <laughs> yeah. We're going to show Monday. Yeah. I know. What's that? You're the best, man. Thank you for doing this. Yeah, absolutely. We'll be there Monday. Uh, I know Tuesday night is going to be the reception. We'll see people there. Uh, and we're going to be hanging out and having fun. If people haven't registered, this is, man, it's it's now down to the wire. But people are, like I said, it was just two days ago. Marsh is answering the call all day, registering people on the phone. Get off. Get on the next thing. And somebody told me that she alone registered like 25 people, which was a shock because I had no idea because I'm just – but uh, go to the website, pcapainted.org, if you want to register. But anyway, uh, I know we talk about it all the time. It's the big, big event of the year. And probably a lot of you are going to be like, I'm glad we don't have to hear about that anymore. <laughs> but um, we're, we're really excited. So thanks for having me on today. And uh, thanks for answering the question. Awesome, man. Always good to talk to you, Chris. Have a good weekend and see you in a few days. Thanks, Chris. All right. See you guys. Thanks. All right. So Chris Shank is going to hang out down below and probably try to distract us a little. Bit. <laughs> All right. So let's get, let's get down to it. Uh, Adam was nice enough to drive down here into the boondocks of New Prague, Minnesota. And he, <laughs> Chris Shank, <laughs> you're the man. Everybody loves Chris Shank. Um, so Adam was nice enough to drive down here. Give us the elevator speech. Who are you? What are you doing? Why are you doing it? Yeah, so I'm the owner of uh, JMJ Painters, along with my wife, Alex, who's uh, at home with our little girl. So um, awesome. we, husband and wife team, do everything together. She's, I tell her, she's acting CEO because she's way better at it than I am. So uh, that's really helpful. Um, we started the business last May, so mm -hmm. we're relatively fresh, not even at a full 12 months yet, but we wanted to get into the business. It's a great business to be in. Um, we love the trade, and specifically, uh, we wanted to bring just a sense of professionalism, a sense of service, and then ultimately everything that we do is to glorify God and to serve the family. Yep. And so uh, right now our focus, we, we're heavy in the residential market. We love working with families. And then as we continue to grow in the commercial market as well, we just always want to remember every single person, every brush stroke is a guy with a family. Um, every single business that's operating is employing a bunch of families every single business owner that we're dealing with or everybody throughout the entire process, we're dealing with families and we're dealing with children of God. And that's ultimately what we want to do is um, lead people closer to Christ and 
uh, serving that way. So that's a little bit about us. Um, it's been a great experience and I appreciate the opportunity to come and pick your brain. Of course. No. And, and you had reached out a little while ago. We got to know each other. We go to the gathering of Minnesota painter meetings. And what intrigued me about you is you're, you're probably the most intentional person I've ever met starting off. Like normally guys like me, we're, we're in this thing for decades and then we have an epiphany, hopefully sooner or later, and then become intentional. But you from day one, it seems like you're very intentional and it, it's indicative of sort of the new breed of craftsman, tradesman, owner, entrepreneur in this sector that's coming in where guys are taking real education, thoughtfulness, intentionality, and they also have a larger picture involved. It's not just, I'm going to do this and maximize it. I'm, it's that plus greater good stuff too, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. intrigues me a lot. So uh, for those of you who, uh, who don't know Adam, follow him uh do we do social media things like that yeah, we are we are building up our social nice. media right now so any nice. followers would be fantastic awesome. <laughs> and, and i assume jmj painting look jmj for, painters uh, painters yeah. yep. painters perfect mm -hmm. well that's awesome um any other little bits of things we should know about you before we dive into the reason you're here today well i think one thing that's particularly interesting and um i'm sure people will have varying opinions of this but my background is not necessarily in painting um, so we've got a master craftsman here and we've got a novice uh, from a from a craft standpoint. Yeah. Um, you know, I've educated, become educated about painting um, mm -hmm. partially through experience and partially through just learning. But my background is more in um, business sales, customer service. And so I've decided how can how can I partner with the guys in the industry who are phenomenal tradesmen yep. who don't necessarily have the business savvy? How can we partner together? Um, I create something that is really benefiting to all parties. And so that's just a little aspect of my background as I'm asking some of these questions that I have prepared um, is I'm always trying to grow and continue to understand the craft itself better. Yep. Uh, so that's a lot of the impetus behind this conversation. And and that's part of the reason that, you know, your, your intentionality intrigues me because um, on paper, you're going to have a way easier time than most of us. Mm -hmm. For the people who are in the trade and the craft and, we have we sometimes get myopic and focus on the paint, the coating, the everything else, and that's fine. But we're missing out on all the other stuff, which is if we do want to create greater good, if we want to take care of our family, our friends, our community, the larger world, things like that, painting will get you a little far. Mm -hmm. But if you do painting plus business, entrepreneurship, solid, sound business acumen, those two together are superpowers. Right. And I've, I've encountered that it's not necessarily that people don't want to. They just don't necessarily know that you can. Uh, it's not even necessarily knowing how to. It's that I can actually do this. And I, that's one of the great things with the Minnesota Gathering of Painters. Yes, we yes. talked about that at the last meeting of bringing up some of the people in the industry who just don't know that there's a different way to do this or they don't feel comfortable saying, hey, we charge you know, X an hour yeah. because we're a professional contractor. Um, they just don't necessarily know. So um, that's a real passion of mine is just helping people understand that wherever you're at in your journey, there's there's more and you can course, and you yeah. can get there and there are people who are willing to help you out and yeah. pull you up uh, to help you learn so don't ever be afraid to reach out to, to anybody yeah. and, and anybody knows who reaches out to me be careful what you wish for <laughs> I, I got a lot to say and uh, as a matter of fact a testament to that everybody who watches my show knows that I'm the biggest fans of the Turies Ryan or uh, Danny and Ryan and uh, they were down here this morning all morning and just opened our books together and their fellow Minnesota painters uh, as a matter of fact two weeks ago we bid against each other on a job <laughs> and I couldn't have been happier because mm -hmm. I know that that client if they have to make that choice either way they're gonna get served yep. really really well and I'm yeah makes me super happy so yeah it's it's open and collaborative and inclusive not exclusive right. that's that's the theme of all this and this is the new breed of contracting yep. I spent 25 years in this trade thinking that every other person wearing white dicky pants was the enemy yeah it was so stupid yeah. it's so stupid and here we are minnesota painters doing this so um you you had originally broached the subject of i got some questions and i said hey let's capitalize on yeah, this yeah. let's do it live <laughs> on the internet so uh you came with some questions and again i don't profess to know everything but i have a certain perspective and that might be helpful. So yeah, what can I be helpful with? Oh, you're going to be helpful with a lot. So <laughs> <clears throat> the first thing um, that I really want to touch on, you have a very particular brand mm -hmm. and uh, you have a very particular attention to the work that you do. Yep. How do you make sure that your team is really clear on the level of attention and detail and care 
how do you help them take the same level of care or close to the same level of care that you do with the client with your projects? Yep, it's a good bit of information to know and to digest that nobody will ever do it as good as you. Mm -hmm. it, from my position, I it, it's a it's not a sad reality, it's a reality reality that if I send one of my people out, my people are the best. They are better than any other painters we're gonna find in the area. But they're never gonna do it as well as a 28 year veteran of the mm -hmm. craft who has thought deeply about it. Now, I'm fine with that because the perspective that I give is we take our scale of one to 100. And this is, I realized this perspective scale a couple of years ago, which is um, I was on a, on a one to 100, 100 being the perfect job, not possible. It's like absolute zero. Like you'll never attain it, but you can get close. I was doing like a 94 or a 95. I was getting close, not perfect. My company was doing a 78 and I was ready to burn it down. I was like, this is crazy. You guys are all stupid. What are you doing? You're not working hard enough. Why don't you get this? Why can't we do this? But the, the perspective that I was missing was the client only wanted a 61. <laughs> and so I was just, I was being unneedily ungrateful to all the people around me. They were performing at such a high level and I was, I was a bad leader mm -hmm. to do that. So the perspective that I got was they're not going to do it as good as me. But what we do now is we create a warm family sense so that people learn quickly. Mm -hmm. So there's, it seems like there's a couple ways to apprentice people or teach people. And we're known for taking people who have never even considered the trades and then dragging them in and then teaching them. And I find the best way to create an autonomous painter is to create a family mentality in your company, warm, inviting, positive, mm -hmm. absolutely unlike the way I was brought up in the trade. <laughs> I was brought up in the trade. Basically you're not doing anything right. You're not doing anything good enough. I don't really like working with you. This isn't good enough. And with my personality, that worked. I, mm -hmm. I excelled in that. But most people don't excel in that. It's not a healthy environment. So I basically have to bite my tongue a lot because I like to correct problems. So I focus on problems. But I get a much better result and people are more happy around me when I'm grateful. I give praise and I mentor and I coach and I focus on the positive. And we just kind of think of the negative as an afterthought. Yeah. So that, that, if we can do that, that creates happy people, which creates the freedom to learn. And magically they do way better work and our standards are higher now. Well, and at what point does it become <laughs> where um, it's no longer looking for problems? It's like, this is actually a problem. How do you broach that with care? And yeah, I, I try to downplay it. Um, and again, this is uh, in, in a long line of what I call human experiments. <laughs> Uh, November of this last year, I basically said, what happens if I didn't say anything even remotely negative? Like we call it the happy Nick experiment, which was <laughs> I didn't have one interaction in the company that wasn't great job. You're doing so good. I appreciate it. None of that was fake. Mm -hmm. I just went out of my way to find people who were doing what I asked of them. Yeah. And instead of praising only the top 1% of the, somebody who just absolutely bowled a client over or killed it on a budget. I went to every single person who met our standards and was like, this is awesome. Production went up. Yeah. So now it 2020 is the year of happy Nick. <laughs> Mostly. <laughs> now I still, I got feedback from one of my people and this is interesting because I've been around too long probably, but my people, they come from different perspectives. They find ways to create conditions on job sites that I've never experienced. Mm -hmm. And I had a habit of saying in my 28 years, I have never experienced this. And they said, can you stop saying that? Like, that makes us feel really sad. Mm -hmm. I said, you know what? That's a really good perspective. I won't do that anymore. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's hard. And, it's, and, you know, experience is half the battle. And that's my, you know, myself and learning and growing yeah. and saying, in my, you know, 10 months, there's a lot I haven't experienced. And so I, I can see where that would be a really. Yeah. But yeah. it's, it's, again, it's an ignorant point of view too, because I have a very myopic sort of view on the entire industry. Like, yes, I have a breadth and width, but it's, it's focused yeah. on yeah. a specific thing. So that's, it's, I shouldn't say that to people. <laughs> well, so then how much do you allow people to, um, is it, this is the exact way that we do things. These are the same materials that we're going to use. This is the same. We swear by these practices. Yeah. Um, how much wiggle room is there in an application method, for instance? Or? There's not. Sure. So uh, what I try to do in order to make, I mean, imagine if you had to learn chemistry and somebody just set you loose in a lab, the complexity is 
infinite. And right. you, you're so boggled by the complexity that you stop functioning. But if you were to just have baking soda and vinegar on a table and say, mix these together, you're also introducing somebody to chemistry, but in a very simple way yeah. and it's a way they can understand it. So what I did uh, in the early years of working alone, I solved all the coding questions that I've ever had. What brush, what primer, what coding, where and how. Mm -hmm. I did it all myself. I tried every variation. I did closely held scientific experiments to rule out any variable, control for variables, and then make sound decisions on that. And I solved all that. Now, it's not perfect, but what I always tell my people is, you know, they always say, well, why don't we use this brush? Why don't we do that? And I say, our clients ask for something specific. And over 28 years, I found the perfect way to give it to them. Mm -hmm. It's this. Mm -hmm. There are other ways. There are better. There are faster. There are more complex ways. There are simpler ways. This meets that need perfectly. So when I make an SOP, it's a 18 step checklist to paint a bedroom. Don't deviate. Sure. So it, it's, it's, it is a little heavy handed, but having one brush that we use on inside painting and one tape allows them the freedom to not worry about, did I get the right brush, right tape? It's, can I learn the technique? It's all the technique. So that's what we focus on. I've ruled out everything and I put blinders on. Yeah. And in turn, we, we turn out autonomous painters very quickly. Yeah. yeah. And so in that aspect too, have you, have you tried some of the new things coming out like a pressure roller or a jet roller, mm -hmm. um, anything like that? And how have they gone? How yes, have they actually you have implemented or specifically not? Specifically that thing. Now, if you're going to get into commercial painting, I would absolutely implore you to experiment more than I did. Uh, we used them on an industrial job that we did. It worked perfect. Mm -hmm. The problem is we don't do many industrial jobs. <laughs> so, so the thing is sitting yeah. in our shop waiting for the next industrial job. Yeah. So yeah. it's great. Um, I'm trying to think of any other examples. Did you try them in a residential? Or are you just saying they did not it know, just be too risky? To no. So, you know, there, there are areas where I'm curious about stuff like that, and I will try it. But when my craftspeople my super thoughtful, masterful craftspeople can paint a bedroom, all the walls from start to finish in like four hours. I don't feel a great need to approve yeah. much on that. Like it, it, it has way more to do with, you know, the, the production per minute is not the problem with painting a bedroom. It's the cleaning, Yeah, you know, and we focus more on the cleaning than that. So it's, yeah, if we, if we had, um, a mile and a half of hallways to do in a college <laughs> dorm, I would absolutely those. <laughs> right. Yeah. But if the thing that it solves isn't your problem, then exactly. It's a know. great tool. It worked perfect for that. Now, yeah. the next time I get that opportunity, I will absolutely yeah. use it. Yeah. <laughs> so then what about when you have more experienced painters coming into your, uh, coming into the fold? Yep. Is it difficult to get them to, cause we, you guys, we use guys from a lot of different backgrounds yes. and they are, um, they, had 20 years of experience that I haven't had. And so to standardize those processes has been somewhat difficult. Um, how do you handle that when you've got multiple backgrounds coming in? There's two theories. Um, number one, uh, if you want what we have, you will do what we do. Yeah, I mean, that's mm -hmm. we, we have a two-pronged approach to recruiting. And if I get too far off, please reel me back in. But we love our decent human beings, people who have never considered the trades we bring them in. This last year, I made a concerted effort to bring in masters, mm -hmm. master crafts people. I want union painters. I want carpenters. I want drywallers. I want people with all sorts of experience. I want fine wood finishers, furniture builders. My people are thirsty for knowledge. So I go out there and I bring these people in. 20% of them really love what we do. They share our company culture and they're in and they actually thrive within our systems. And in turn, I allow them to innovate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, the, the deal is always... Show me you can do it my way. This mm -hmm. is not me being a jerk. Our clients ask for something specific, yeah. and this is the perfect fit. This is the key for that lock. Yeah. There are other keys. We can try those other locks and other keys later, but please just do this for now. When those people come in and they can do that and show me they can do under budget, quality work with no callbacks under our systems, you want to try different paint, you want a different roller, you want your own specific tools, you, you have it all. Yeah. The problem is getting those crafts people over that first hurdle. Because most times you can't trust the paint business owner. A paint business owner will tell you to do something and it doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. You know, like, why are we using this paint? It's horrible. It doesn't cover. If we're having coverage issues or if it's stipply and you're making me use these cheap brushes, that's not our problem. We have, 
we are different and we're punished for it because I have tried everything, <laughs> every way, every how I've done outlier stuff. I've done simple stuff. I've done whatever you can do. And I've actually found a super effective way to do it. And we just need people who can trust us. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we do fight with that because I've made a concerted effort to bring these people in. We are dealing with more of that. Mm -hmm. And we have attrition too. There's yeah. some people who come on and they love it. And then one day they do what experienced painters do, which is yeah, some other guy paid me 50 cents an hour and I don't care. So I'm leaving, you know, and it's like, well, that was never meant to be anyway. Yeah. So yeah. it's tough, man. Yeah. yeah. Is there, um, as you are, um, I forgot what I was going to ask. Oh, we'll move on. Um, so when you are, oh, this is what I was going to ask. Are you the one, because you're talking about, we promised a customer a very specific thing. Are you doing all your sales? I am. Okay. Has that always been the case? Yes. Yeah. I have done every estimate in my entire company up until this point. Wow. Yep. That's awesome. I'm, I just wonder. Sort of. <laughs> well, yeah, I suppose. Yeah. It would be great to have help. Yeah. 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 Is that something that you've considered or is it kind of like even then at the same time, are we going to be promising the same thing that we deliver if I let somebody else go and do that sales aspect? Yeah. So, um, I've done, I've done some, because I know that controlling labor, creating a labor force is basically how you win in this industry right now. I mean, we're in a town of 7,500 people. Mm -hmm. There's 2.3% unemployment and I've hired 12 people in the last three months. Mm -hmm. Like, it's possible. So don't say you can't, there's no good help out there, right? Make there's, your good help, right? I'm having trouble picking between my next three applicants right yeah. now. So it's, yeah. but I say that uh, because I've done, I know that labor, you win with labor and, and good people. So what I did, I, I consider, I consider my business having like three kind of silos of people. There are painters, craftspersons, you know, trades people. There is my production team and then there's sales. And for each one of those things, I want to, I love scientific experiments. So what I did was I worked with uh, Art Snarzik of Interview Advisors who helps with disc profiles. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what I did was I took a, I took a disc profile. Like I was the perfect craftsman. Like mm -hmm. not, I don't have to run a business. All I have to do is focus on craft. I took it like that. And now we have a benchmark. This is what a personality type looks like for the perfect mm -hmm. Nick Slavic craftsman. Not, not me craftsman, Nick Slavic painting right. and restoration right. craftsman. I did it for production manager and I did it for sales. The painter part is working out great uh, as well as it can be. We are in a industry of feral cats still. <laughs> and you know that too. Mm -hmm. You probably deal with more of that with the subcontractors and things you have. Mm -hmm. So still it's successful. It's overwhelmingly successful, but it's still not perfect. The production manager one is perfect. Yeah, I've, I'm two for two. They are the greatest humans on earth, world-class production people. They pick it up in no time. They excel. They do it better than I do. Mm -hmm. that, that's two for two. I've hired two to work out good. I've done that for sales. Quarter three, I hire my first salesperson. So the process is there. The benchmark is there. The guidelines, the uh, deliverables, and the employment contract is there. We're going to focus the two first quarters on growing our craftspeople to about 20 to 25 the second we have that in place, I get that task. And it's it still makes me nervous. Mm -hmm. It's a tough one. <laughs> so well, it's coming. It's coming. Man. <laughs> and, and we need it and we're gonna need it anyway. Yeah. So it's I don't have a choice. Uh, but it is a it is a the next biggest leadership hurdle because training a painter for me is fun and it's easy. And it's I have to I can turn my brain off and anything anybody asks, I can help with, I can show them how, I can improve, I can mentor production. I now trust those people. I, I did it fairly well. They do it better. So now I let them innovate. But with sales, we're going to cross a threshold where the only contact with my company might not be me. Yeah. Like there might be Nick Slavic painting and restoration. My face is on everything. And somebody may never meet me in the whole chain of mm -hmm. estimate, production, painting. And that's a higher challenge. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> that's a unique, unique thing. Be, yeah. I'm excited to follow that and see how it goes. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited to. <laughs> no, it'll be good. It, and again, it just, I know it just takes human hours. There's not a magic video. There's not a magic spreadsheet. There's not a magic checklist. If I want this to be a win, I need to devote a lot of hours to mentoring somebody to do what I do. And in hopes that I can, I can get some of my craftspeople do things better than I do. Both my production managers do something better than I do. 
with this, I want somebody to amaze me every mm -hmm, day because mm -hmm. I am not good at sales. <laughs> like my personality type is not there. So what I want somebody is somebody who's a world-class salesperson, cares about the client and does better than I could ever even do. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we will see. Yeah. We will see. It's a well-paid job. So hopefully you find somebody. Right. right exactly. <laughs> Well, and you take care of people and you create the environment that people want to work in. And but, it's, and again, it's just like painting. Uh, we start off every Monday morning meeting with, it's not painting, it's client care. Yeah. Master that and we'll actually get some painting done. And estimating is the same thing too. It's just a spreadsheet, dude. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, there's not, we hold it so precious, all these things. Oh, what kind of oil primer? What kind of roller yeah, cover? Yeah. At some point, who cares? Take care of the client. Right. And estimating is the same thing. Address their needs and they'll get a price. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So how did you, when did you um, start to learn more about your business practices? What, when did you start, how did you learn about all of this starting out when you started to think about it and how could you have accelerated that learning? Oh, do what you're doing now. Like I, I was in this industry for 25 years before I talked to another painter. You were probably in this, you probably weren't even in this industry yet. You had I was to, not. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Like you were like thinking about it and you reached out to people like that is so much smarter than the way I did it. That is the way to do it. So like, just like I said with Shank on there, everybody was the enemy until Chris invited me to my first expo. I go to the expo and a guy puts his arm around me and is like, Hey man, what's your name? And you know, it's, oh yeah. And I, I came to this expo thinking everybody's going to be talking about oil primer and the fine brushes and the <laughs> scales. Nobody talked about painting. Yeah. It was all business and it blew me over because I, I was coming heavy with, I got so much to tell these people. Uh -huh. Like I've never talked to another painter. I know it all. I'm going to inform all these people about all this great knowledge I have. And I showed up and it was the most humbling experience in my mm -hmm. life. Like mm -hmm. I never once thought about business. Business to me was pay faster, yeah. make yeah. more money. And that works for a couple of years. This guy who put his arm around me, like, hey, how many guys you got working for you? Well, just me, you know, and how much, how much money you making? What's your problems? How you doing? They're kind of feeling me out. And I was like, wow, that's kind of nice, man. We kind of worked through it. I'm like, yeah, you guys must be in kind of, you know, we're all here together as painters, huh? And he's like, oh yeah, by the way, I run an $18 million industrial painting company. <laughs> it's all up and down the East Coast. And uh, anytime you need anything, call me. And yeah, yeah. That person, uh, Dave Scaturo, I actually talked to this morning. Yeah. And he still is offering that. He we're talking about setting goals for the year, and he shared me his goals for his monster industrial painting company. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. it dudes like him changed my life, like seriously. And and just knowing that it's there, knowing that there's Dave Scaturos out there, is I'm never going to do what he does. I'm not interested in you know sandblasting water tanks, but I've learned more from him than just about anybody else. Yeah, so that's what I found too. Was just, and that's part of why I wanted to, I mean, we've had several conversations. Yeah. It's been incredibly insightful because yeah. you just, you don't know what you don't know. Right. So I don't know. I mean, exactly. It's the cliche, but at this point, I, I, I think it would be the coolest thing on earth to know nothing about this or at least have an idea about it and then go get knowledge on it. Yeah. Cause it has been my life since I was 10 years old and I'm too far. Yeah. You know, and sometimes it, it, it hinders me because I really wish I had fresh eyes on this whole thing. And I think, the closest thing I got to that was that four or five years ago when in, in, getting introduced to all those people like Dave. And yeah, that was, that was that crisis of faith moment where you're mm -hmm. like, Oh, I'm stupid. <laughs> like this is all, I've been so unintentional with my life. So it's, it's so impressive to me guys like you who before day one, you're more intentional than I've been in two decades. So yeah. Well, impressive might be a strong word. We're still figuring <laughs> it out, but yeah, but you, you know, just like uh, Ryan and uh, Danny Turi, who were here this morning, husband and wife team, mm -hmm. first couple of years of business, they're already sending personal and professional boundaries and stuff like that. And you talk to my wife, I don't know if we have those yet. Yeah. <laughs> you know, after, after two decades. So, yeah. I was going to ask you, I mean, we're on the top. I mean, it's Valentine's yeah. Day. Yeah. So absolutely. happy Valentine's Day, Alex. And absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was just wanted to ask you, what, what role does, how does this all work with your family life? I mean, family's obviously very important to you and that's part of your value system. That's a awesome. Um, how do you, you and your wife integrate the business into your life? Um, right. Especially with this old house. I mean, yeah. how does it all mesh yeah. together? It's a, so my wife's a saint. All of our wives are saints. That helps. My wife <laughs> is a long suffering angel. Um, I, for many years, I toiled on just like my father did with a very regressive paint business where un unintentional, unthoughtful, just brute strength. You run a good business by bowling people over with customer service and just painting a lot. Mm -hmm. And 
I made a lot of promises to her that life is going to be great. I know what life can be with painting. Seven years later, I was just working more hours, you know, and then finally you realize that some other people don't work 17 hours a day in manual labor and forsake their families and things like that. And I was like, okay, now we set boundaries. And uh, my wife has, ever since our first child, it was, I, I, I love this. She stayed home right after she had our first child. That was our intention all along. And I love that that boundary was put on from day one. It wasn't like, let's have a bunch of kids and find out where the breaking point of paying for daycare is. Right, right. What we did right away. She's like, oh no, I'm taking care of our kids. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, now I have that boundary. And we must, I mean, that comes with it financial burdens and it comes with that time burdens. Mm -hmm. But what it also did was she, she didn't have to do this. She let me do whatever I want with the business for a decade, which was if I felt like I want to try something, if I want to experiment, if I want to travel, if I want to do public speaking, I did it all and it allowed us to be where we are today. And starting this last year, I started paying back those promises mm -hmm. of I'm going to set a weekly schedule and I'm going to do the same things at every time, every week. And part of that is in one hour, I'm done mm -hmm. and I hang out with my family mm -hmm. and we're probably going to go to school and help out in my classroom. So evenings, as we grow the business this year, I give up about an hour of evening time every day to catch up with estimates for people. But starting next year, with the help of my new estimator, yeah. Nick is done at five yeah. every day. And also Friday afternoons are off and I haven't worked a weekend in 10 years. So slowly we're ratcheting, I'm, I'm coming good with the promises. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how about you, man? How do you, how do you handle it? Oh, my wife stays at home too. And she's, she's first and foremost mom. And uh, yeah. that's been a really beautiful thing. The nice thing is um, just because we, um, I office out of home, oh, right? And that's so really, really nice. And so, mm -hmm. Um, and especially now, more and more of our work is local. And so when it's just a hike down the street yes. and I just come right back home and I'm working on it, um, she let me set up a dual monitors in our in our bedroom. So there's a little office Mine is there. right so, below us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's there. So, but I think that um, part of that is she's from a, a, an entrepreneurial family. And so she, in a lot of ways, introduced me to business ownership. Oh, and awesome. is and I, I'm not kidding when I said she's better than me. And so if she was, uh, maybe she could get on next time with me. Yeah. <laughs> you would be amazed. Um, you'd be amazed. So she is. We we talk through everything together, all of our decisions, and um, saying, okay, here's where we're thinking about taking the business. Here we do our goal setting together, and it's just us right now. And so from a practical standpoint, it's us and our partners who we continually, um, you know, we talk about it. How's it going with this person? Oh, God, and, yeah. Um, it's been. It's incredible because um, it's one of the things that um, we've learned is work-life balance is a myth. It's integration. Yeah. Everything should be integrated. And it yeah. doesn't mean that everything is just all kind of mushed together and unintentional. Yeah. It means that our business is a part of our yeah. life together. Our family is a part of our life together. So um, from a practical standpoint, we spend every morning together um, and I don't start doing business stuff usually until 10 or so. Yeah. But then, yeah. you know, last night I'm working till 9.30. Yep. But that's okay. Exactly. Um, and we and we have that set. We take a date every week. I mean, we, we have these things set up so that we have time together um, and we can both get the stuff that we need to. There is a definite through line here and it's been the theme of my life and it sounds like it's not, it's either been the theme of your life forever or is ramped up, but intentionality, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. you don't need to, there's this whole like, <laughs> there's a lot of weird business stuff from the eighties where it's like, if you go on vacation, I'm shutting that phone off. I'm throwing that computer out. I'm not talking to anybody. It's like, I don't know, man. I don't think you need such abrupt things. Mm -hmm. Like if you're intentional about your time, you produce a lot of stuff at work and then you do burst of intentional time with family. Yep. You're still spending more time with your family than 90% of the world out there, yep. but you're also being effective to provide them with a better life. Mm -hmm. The only thing we have to be careful for. And, and I was, I was, I fell into this a while ago. It was unintentionality of, I'm just going to keep working harder, but I didn't have like a plateau or a step or a goal. It was like this. I know if I just work harder, things will be better. And then eventually I'll get to work less. Yeah. But I never thought of the steps between where I was and there. You obviously have, and I have in the last year, but that's only been a recent discovery for me. But mm -hmm. just working harder isn't going to give you a blue drink on a beach yeah. with your business running itself. There's many things need to happen and they have to be intentional. Right. You know, so I'm a big believer in that whole thing too. Of I wake up really early. 
so that I can have evenings with my kids, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm fine to do that. I'm a morning person anyway, but super, if I'm going to get up early, it's going to be super productive. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then hopefully at five, when I'm done, I'm going to be super productive with the kids, right. you know, so yeah. And you have the energy for it too, because you know, you, you want to be doing everything that you're doing. And we have, I mean, I, I'm not working hundred hour weeks, no. right? And that's the thing too, is especially starting out, we don't need to do that to accomplish what we need to do. When you work smarter, not harder. You can certainly, right. if you want to work a hundred hour week, good. I would, I would have a plan for each of those hours mm -hmm. and say, okay, for six months, I can accomplish this if I put in yep. 6,000 hours. And it's also February. So there's yeah. a practical standpoint, of, you know, so uh, this yeah. is a, this would be a different conversation in June maybe, but exactly. we also know that. And so, okay, great this year, because this winter I'm kind of grinding to, to mm -hmm. keep rolling, but we're saying, these are our goals for the summer. Yep. We want to have 90% of our revenue by October. Yep. And so if we've got that, things will trickle on, but then Absolutely. we can take our time in the winter. Yep. We can focus on the business, spend time together, um, focus on our family, um, and just do that a little proactively, right? And I've even talked to our painters about that because I see them um, when I'm getting texts all the time, hey, what's next, what's next, what's next? And yep. I'm just saying, this year, I'm going to hold back some of your pay yeah. and get it agreed to and get it all in writing. But to say, all right, I'm going to hold back. How much do you need yeah. the months between December uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and yep. February? Uh -huh. I'll hold it back. It's your money. It's in a separate account, but I will disperse it at agreed upon time. So you don't have to worry about it and they can take some time off too, because exactly. they're not necessarily thinking about that either. Yeah. And, and, you know, we also have to say that a lot of humans are unintentional with their money too. Absolutely. When it's good, they yeah. don't have the perspective that it's not going to be not as good. Right. And maybe some purchases get made that don't exactly set them up. And that's a very, I mean, that's a very wise thing to do because that's the lifestyle difference that even money throughout the year makes yeah. versus dang, August is just like, let's go buy a new super duty. It's right. like, well, All right. there's December too. So yeah. hold tight. <laughs> and we're not, and we're not paying salaries. And so it's kind of like, I mean, realistically what do you need what have you been making it off that's of very, this whole time so that's definitely something you don't need to do but shows your care for that stuff well yeah. also it's going to make them better it's a long game yeah it's a long game for sure yeah i'm going to check in some comments yeah if you please do. See. oh man evan thanks for watching dominic from across the pond thanks for watching man <laughs> um alex marchuk i tell my guys do what you want in your own time if i catch you high or drunk on the job you're fired I think that's a great policy. <laughs> uh, chasing the unicorn, probably talking about my salesperson. Dominic, thanks so much, man. Yeah. Thanks everybody for watching too. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. So one thing that, um, that I really want to touch on, so this is really important to us is making sure that we understand what the client wants and mm -hmm. is looking for. Mm -hmm. How do you help the client find that in their, in their idea of what this project is? Because you've got the zero to hundred spectrum. There's only goes up to 61. Right. Yeah. But, what's what it's not it's not usually just we need paint on oh, the walls. there's usually a reason and they don't so usually many know thoughts, man so i i have the benefit of doing seven to eight hundred estimates a year for 10 years so i got a data set that's mm -hmm. incredible mm -hmm. and because i've done every one and because i do scientific experiments I've, <laughs> I've i've done more human experiments with that yeah. over the years and i found that most of the time the client will never tell you what would make them the most happiest. Right. What you have to do is just say, rarely does it, it's good perspective to know a client, almost none of my clients want museum quality restoration. Mm -hmm. What they want is somebody they can trust mm -hmm. and who's not gonna leave a mess. So in my business, over all these years, I have spent 80% of my time thinking about things outside of painting that we can do for clients. and. I've realized that again, simplicity is another hallmark of what we do. Instead of a 17 page contract that they sign where it says, we're going to do this and we're going to do this. If this, then that, then this, then that. The back of my estimate has a couple FAQs and then it has three things on it, which is we help with color, we move furniture, we wipe glove clean your home. That's all I care about. Mm -hmm. they, I mean, nobody asks about paint or shine or rollers or most of the time people don't even ask, am I going to do it or is somebody else going to do it? Yeah. You can, they, they won't come out and say, Nick, the three most important things to me are color. Cause that's the hardest part about any project. Right. And then I don't know what to do with my furniture. I'm a, I'm a 68 year old widow. Yeah. I'm, I can't move all this stuff. And then it's like they've had contractors in their house and they destroy their house. 
drywall guy will leave drywall footprints all the way down the front walk and out to his car. And they'll, they'll, I've had people like mess up trash cans, like dump paint. And oh, trash. Yeah. So oh, yeah. the problem is they will never come out and say, these are the three things that are most important. My data set has proven to me that if you do those three things, you will make way more happy clients than doing museum quality restoration over and over again and being a mediocre human. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's what we focus on. And we have a tight system around every single one of those. Yeah. Can you define white glove cleaning? Yeah, we call it white glove only because it's a reference point for the client. Yeah. What we actually do is um, when we move all the furniture in the middle of the room, we a, a point of pride is we vacuum behind the furniture. Mm. Like that's, I mean, <laughs> people don't do that in their own home. Yeah. We got the furniture <laughs> out anyway. Leave Might us well. your vacuum out. We'll, we'll just buzz around the outside real quick. Great. That's something that you would never do on your own. We're happy to do it. It's easy. Yep. We vacuum. We sweep if it's a hard surface. And then and we do every morning towels and we look for every flat surface in the room mm -hmm. and we wipe it down mm -hmm. and if it's a if it's a wood floor like we are here what they'll do at the end is microfiber water wring it out all the way and just start at one end of the room it takes you three and a half minutes to wipe down a floor on your hands and knees that's a huge add-on and when when i'm on an estimate and i say those three things to people they're bowled over they're like i cannot and you can see it going off in their head my other contractor told me, I don't deal with color. That ain't my problem. Yeah. You you tell me what paint, you tell me what color. And the client's like, you're the pro. Right, right. Can't you tell me? Like, right. you're here. You're the pro. I'm going to pay you. The furniture. People are looking around their house like, I mean, look at this dang couch, man. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. uh, I would be like, oh, come on, man. I need yeah. help moving the couch. Yeah. When you can address those things, you can see it in their head like, oh, my God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've had horrible experiences with contractors mm -hmm. around every one of these. And you have just said, that's all free, basically. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's a great answer. Yeah. What kind of things? Um. So, those are the things that people really, really care about. Yeah. Have you found things that people are particularly picky about? Just very particular on this or that. How do you address those things? Even shine. Even shine. That I mean, yeah. everybody can look down a wall, and if there's a big flash mark right down the middle of the wall, you know, it's that proverbial stairwell with the huge light or the huge window, breaking uh -huh. light, middle of the day. They pick chocolate brown and you've got 40, 40 linear feet of wall to go from one end to the other very right. quickly to keep a wet edge. Right. The, the goal, like there's the, if I could focus on one thing, it would just be taking care of the client and we would get some painting done. Yeah. If we have to focus on an aspect of painting to make the client like bang for the buck, if you can get an even thing, it doesn't even have to be a good paint or a good shine. If it's even, that's a win yep. every time. Yep. And when you couple that with, there's a whole bunch of sneaky sort of things like premium paint doesn't always equal easy to use an even shine. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it goes off the cliff where it's harder to use and it's harder to get an even shine. So there's certain products. And because I experiment all the time, we find something that we don't use fine paints a year. It takes too much skill for our people. Sure. What I do is find products that even an apprentice three weeks in, they have a 90% chance of getting a beautiful even shine on the wall. Mm -hmm. So it's just one of those, like you have to tailor the products to your client. If I did all the painting, I would basically do the same process that my people use, the same products. I would tweak it a little bit only because my skill set is different. Sure. But it wouldn't be drastically different. Sure. So, yeah. so what kind of what kind of things do you do for the even shine in particular? Ha, scream wet edge. <laughs> it, all you're doing is just screaming wet edge. Um, there's, I, I video, but videotape sound like a thousand years old <laughs> on Facebook live. Yeah. I, I, I Facebook live myself in front of my entire company painting a bedroom. It took me two hours and 40 minutes from start to finish from moving furniture. <laughs> and in that I show people very closely that you focus on one wall, the same wall. Every time you walk into the proverbial bedroom, you walk through a door, turn around and start in that corner. Face the door, lower left hand side, you cut. You go from the bottom, you go up, you go over, down, and around. You immediately roll the wall. And when you roll the wall, you go top to bottom and you keep that wave moving over and over again. One roller full will give you two and a half to three top to bottom lengths. Mm -hmm. Dip the roller in three lengths, dip the roller in three lengths. If you do that correctly and you have a decent skill set, like most other humans have on this earth, that wall will still be wet yep. at the end. Then you go to the next wall, up, over, down, round, three, 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 and that's it. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. When we have the benefit, when we have tough walls, then we will do the cutter and roller. If we got that huge 28-foot foyer wall, 
you got one guy cutting and one guy rolling right behind for wet edge. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's just a, it's not a trick roller cover. Yeah. It's, it's human skill. Mm -hmm. It's just a different movement of that same roller cover. So, yeah. Oh, that's great. <clears throat> and then I don't know how many, uh, I don't know how many, I guess, upset clients you get. What do you get them? Yeah, what do you handle? Absolutely. How do you handle that? What kind of things do you do to make that right? We attack. Mm. We attack. We're not not a attack. Yeah, I'm so good. Attack. It's kind of attack. <laughs> how dare you? How dare you? Yeah, how dare you would question this? Is us. perfect. Yeah. So we track we track callbacks uh, uh -huh. on every on every job uh -huh. and as a percentage. Um, I'm trying to I'm trying to remember what our quarter four callback was, but we we get callbacks just like everyone else, and we have tight systems where we would have way many more callbacks if we did not have the systems we do. Mm -hmm. If we didn't clean a house, we would probably have double the amount of callbacks because sure. people say you left a mess. Yeah. So that alone will stop many hours of coming back to a job site because you left dust on the ground. So <laughs> um, we attack. Um, I have the luxury now of having two production managers who are incentivized by small amount of callbacks. So we've designed systems to do that. And it has everything to do with when I sell the job, I promise one thing. Again, back to these promises. It's simple. I promise you an even shine and a clean house. Mm -hmm. And we're going to help with color. You know, and we're going to move furniture. If we've done all that, it, clients don't ask for much more than right, that. Right. And they ask for trustworthy people. That's beyond their expectations anyway. That's right. Yeah. We're already doing we're already doing a 64 and they only want a 55. Yep. You know, so the production manager's goal is to then take the promises that I made and I am insanely consistent. I mean, I'm not a robot on these things, but I don't promise anything we're not going to do. Mm -hmm. And they take that, we have a set system, they rely on me. I'm never going to be a wild card and say, of course we do seven coats of paint on your wall. You know, <laughs> they take that and they set the job up in the same way. They set the expectations again. They reiterate, we're going to use this paint on these walls and these color. We're going to start this day. Expectations are set. Once they meet our five to seven hurdles that the production managers put in front of them, we schedule the job. Normally, the, the benefit of our company is our painters can kick themselves off. So they can go to the shop. There's a The paint has already been delivered. They have a work order that we call a jump sheet. They look at the name and the address and they show up at the site. And because we have tight systems, everything is as it should be. When it says you have six bedrooms of paint and here's the bedrooms and here's the notes, it magically matches every time. There's no confusion. During the process, they check in and they inspect. And they we, we have at least two to three check-ins every day with most of our people. And then at the end, if it's like a simple wall painting job, we normally don't have a production manager there to close it out. Mm -hmm. But when we have a big trim cabinet job, they're there making sure every cabinet door is aligned, every bit of dust is off, and then we send out the invoice immediately. And it's this tight system of we've not dropped that trust ball mm -hmm. from number one. They've met me, my logo on everything I have matches, I look like myself in the picture, right. my vans look like me and, and our, our logos. We promise them something, our production managers promise the same, our painters do what we promise, and when we get callbacks, there are genuinely human errors that happen. Most of the time, it has to do with personality differences mm -hmm. in clients. Like we can tell from the start, some clients have a personality where we, we have a very tight thing. What room, what color would you like? And we can't get it out of them. We mm -hmm. say, okay, this is a red flag. Mm -hmm. We are going to try to help this client through this, but they're not going to make it easy. Yeah. You know, and some people will not trust us. Rightly so, because contractors are normally horrible people. Mm -hmm. People think they have to outsmart their contractors right, because right. most of the time they do, right? Right. Yeah. So we don't blame them. We don't hold it against them. We just always tell people, I stole this from another painter. I have a process to make you happy. The statistical probability of your happiness goes down every time you go against one of our processes. So you want to provide your own paint. You want to move your own furniture. You want to patch your own walls. You've just lost 7% happiness quotient. <laughs> you know, and down yeah, and down yeah. you go. All the way to you won't tell me what color you just show up and like oh the paint will be there for you this is not going to go well for you yeah because we have a process please trust us yeah. so <laughs> wow yeah it's amazing too i mean you still there's no fear in that it's not like oh we do we really want to work with this person because a lot of people then it's like oh, oh hey is, i'll email it to you and then this is just... this is my fault as a leader i have a folder that's called never forget <laughs> And there are four jobs in there yeah. and they all follow the same personality type, the same type of project, the same, they gave it every single indication from time one. I've been a, this comes from me. 
I've been a poor leader to say, we're better than this. We should be able to fix this. We should be able to solve this person's problem. It turns out maybe nobody can. Right. And we just were the ones, not stupid enough, but we were the ones that should have just said, everybody would be better here if we just stopped talking to you. Mm -hmm. You know, it again, it happens once a year. Out of 375 jobs, you get one. Right. And it's just, it is what it is. Right. So nobody's perfect. We obviously create situations to create callbacks and we have customer complaints every once in a while. A theme that has been going on within the company and me and the production team is when something doesn't make sense, we need a bit of information. Mm -hmm. Like when a client is completely irrational about how you must be here on Wednesday at 3 p.m. to start this project. Like that's very inconvenient for us. Is there any way we can do Monday at eight? Mm -hmm. and, and then they get angry. And it's like, wow, that's surprising. Like um, really interesting. Uh, how can we, like, we don't know what the problem is. We don't know, like there's, there's feelings behind it. Yeah. Every time when we deal with something like that, we're missing a bit of information. When we get that bit of information, boom, everything snaps into focus. You're like, oh, I completely understand why Thursday at 3 p.m. is a good start time mm -hmm. for you. There's a sick child coming home from a hospital or right. something on that day, and they, they need the time to get, the, you know, it's any of those things, but they won't come out and tell you. So that is the theme. Like the production managers even smile. It's like <laughs> we're missing a bit of information. Mm -hmm. We need focus. And then with enough conversations, they're like, we got it. We found it. This is it. Like, and then it all snaps into focus. So, but people will never just say that. Yeah. You know, so I don't know. Well, and you've earned the trust. So at that point, you can actually. Well, it's tough. And sometimes we don't earn the trust. And that's why that raises our red flag. Like, sure. We need a bit of information. We're really good at getting people's trust. Like, if you don't trust us, you're not going to trust a lot of other people. I mean, yeah. You know, it's like we, we wear, you know, collared shirts. All our bands are logo. Our people are the kindest humans on earth. If you don't trust us, there's something we're not being made privy to. You know? Well, and something I think I've continually grown understanding of is saying this is not a small investment. I mean, this is a, this oh, is, too, I was thinking about it for people's um, just percentage of income per year. And when you go do a job and you think, what percentage of this person is you're changing income the color of something? Oh, yeah. You're not adding on to the house. You're right. not, you know, it's, yeah. So it's, it's good perspective to have that for a standard exterior paint job, you can buy a car most of the time. Oh, yeah. Not a great car, yeah. but a car. And they're going to hand that over. They're not going to finance it. Mm -hmm. Like they're just going to write you a check at the end of this. And sometimes as business owners can get jaded and be like, oh, I should be charging more. I should be doing that. It's like, would you pay $8,900 right. to paint the outside of your house? You yeah. probably, you'd probably call a guy a crook. Yeah. You know? I just so. talked to somebody at a, um, I just called a, another contractor and I was talking to the receptionist and she said, I can't afford to hire us. And it was just a, it was a really insightful comment. And there was, there was no animosity from her. It was yeah. just, this is the reality. Is We're the targeting reality. a certain, our company works with a certain level of income. And I'm not that. Yep. And so it's just, it is humbling then to say, this is a, this is more than just putting paint on a yep. wall. And it has to be more than putting paint on a wall. I, I am sick of painters taking an adversarial approach to their clients. Like, um, I don't, I don't normally have such forceful opinions, but it does, it does irk me a little bit when painters try to, the first phone call they have with a client is they try to tell them, well, I'm super expensive. You probably don't want me. And they're trying to, what they call pre-qualify, mm -hmm. but what they're really trying to do is just see how much money they can get out of people. Sure, and yeah. it's like, how about you listen to the client and ask what they want? Maybe they want a super budget job because they're selling the house. Maybe they're looking for yeah. museum yeah. quality restoration and you're coming at it adversarially instead of asking, what is your biggest concern in this project? What what a bad situations have you had in the past? Mm -hmm. They are they're coming out forcefully. They're almost trying to get this person to say, "I I just want the best and I'll pay for it." Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like, I don't. It's a weird interaction. It's not bad. They just could be handled better because the client sniffed that right away, and that's your first interaction. You know. And then again, if you don't understand what's the purpose behind this. Your pricing may not be right anyway. That's right. And most, and, yeah. and you know, you've talked to just enough painters now to know that most of these guys have no idea what's going on financially in their company. So mm -hmm. when they say they're the most expensive, I don't know. Maybe you're not. Yeah. Maybe you're a really good deal and you're just saying that stupidly yeah. to people, you yeah. know? Because there's a lot of guys who say, well, I charge, you know, if, if Nick charges X for cabinets, I'm charging X.5 <laughs> and I'm super expensive. But maybe you're a master craftsman that can get it done in half the time that my apprentices can. You just created a better value for the client than the lower price Nick can. Right. You know, so right. yeah. Yeah, value rather than price. I mean, that's and that's reflected. <laughs> and I've, I've been talking to people and the people who are 
really trying to elevate the industry. It's about value. And, um, nice. and the value, and I just, the value is like you said, it's less and less about the actual production. I mean, the production needs to be at a certain point. Yeah. And what I found is too, if there's an issue with communication or there's an issue with trust, all of a sudden the job doesn't look as good as it, you know, <laughs> Dude, listen, you just said one of the truest things on the face of the planet. Yeah. I, I, I say this all the time to everybody in my company, which is if your shirt's untucked or if you, you know, maybe put a cigarette butt out on the sidewalk yeah. or if you're doing vape smoke out in front of their house, they are now going to be looking at this project differently. Mm -hmm. They're going to have their guard up mm -hmm. saying mm -hmm. something about this. I, I don't not trust you, but now I'm looking. If from every touch point, it's overwhelming trust, they will look at the project completely differently. Yeah. They, they approach their own house adversarially if you if they can't trust you. They're just looking for things. So, so true what you said, man. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's not fixed by a discount. Right? I mean, it can be almost worse. It can almost yeah. be, I, I came from a lady's house too, where again, it's a proverbial, they went to Home Depot. Home Depot just sends a dude over and they're mm -hmm. wrestling with horrible craftsmanship, like embarrassing amounts of things down to the house. And then the guy just calls up and says, why don't you just give me 2,300 bucks and we'll call it even. I won't come back. And it's like, and the homeowner was like, that's one option, or you could do the job right. And we could, it's just like, that doesn't solve anything. She sees that guy as worse now. It's like, oh, you're just like a, you're sleazy. Yeah. Yeah. We fight against that stuff, man. Mm -hmm. it's, it's still a lot of the industry, but. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's good to be able to, I mean, it's good to see, I love the Minnesota Gathering and Painters. It's good to see everybody who's trying to yep. go in the right direction. It's a self selecting group of some of the most thoughtful craftspreneurials in the country. It's just an insane thing. It's fun to meet a couple, I mean, I'm meeting other painters too who, who aren't necessarily, don't even know about it and to say, you should be there. Yes. And it's exciting yeah. To, yeah. to do that too. It's just gonna keep growing, so Agreed. that's awesome. So one thing I've got, um, we're getting, or we can go to some of the comments. Let me just, you, uh, yeah, you ask away and I can, uh, yeah, I can, I can read a few of these here, so. So one of the things I was gonna, um, I'm really curious about your thoughts. Um, what's something that you think the industry is going to encounter next? Um, whether it's a down market or whether it's a, hey, there's this, there's something else that I think is on the horizon. Yeah. And how do you think um, it's going to impact it? Amazon. I mean, mm -hmm. it, the, the Amazon effect of one click buying um, in its simplest terms, again, I've done experiments with this where, you know, right now I can order a wash machine. It'll be here tomorrow. Right. One click, right. you know, if, if the contracting world, my father doesn't own a cell phone or own a computer. It's not that he has them and he hates them. He doesn't own them. Mm -hmm. if, if you on the same day can order a wash machine and have it here tomorrow and you try to get a painter and you get a voicemail that doesn't get answered for six days and then he calls you back and leaves a voicemail because he doesn't text you or email and this chain goes on like that, you can obviously see where the friction points in this is. Okay. And then my father will then ask you for directions to your house because he doesn't own a GPS or a phone to get you to the house. And yeah. you can you can tell that this is painful. Like and, yeah. and as us as millennials, it makes me want to throw up into a trash can. <laughs> it's like this is gonna be a painful experience from day one. Yeah. You know, you're not even gonna bother. You're not it's like, oh, there's gotta be an easier way, dude. Like I would settle for something less if I just could one click it at some point. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes you want the personal interaction, and sometimes you're like, it's just a wash machine, dude. Can you just <sighs> Don't ask me for directions. Just make it show up in my house, you yeah, know. Yeah. And so you can tell how, on a simple way, I've done experiments to say, okay, contractors are horrible at calling people back and getting people estimates. We've all been on this thing where, yeah, it took him two weeks to get here. He was here, and I still. It's a week later. I still don't have an estimate. It's like I don't. I don't know. So, I I profusely make contact. It doesn't matter if you set up an estimate four months from now. If you yeah. make contact and set it up, that's satisfying to all clients. Yeah. It is what it is. Also, the on-the-spot estimates so, where you got the mobile printer in your van, you got your tablet in your hand, and if you have your production rates down and you yep. have your experience, you walk into the house, and my turnaround for an estimate is 23 minutes. Yep. I walk into the house, people walk around, I'll, I'll pet dogs, I'll talk about anything you want, I can still get it in 23 minutes if they want. Well, I think everybody, I mean, people can pride themselves on building rapport. We can all build rapport. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> We're all good with relative. I mean, there's some dudes like Jason Paris who uh, aren't that I good. Suppose, with you okay. interact. <laughs> Maybe he's not. But I just like to make fun of Jason. But well, no, there is. Yeah, the problem. Yeah, the problem is like 
the reporter isn't going to do it. Sooner or later, people are going to be like, yeah, but I kind of like a price on this, right. you know, and contractors are bad. So in a micro way that I can control and that can be immediately done is call the damn people back. Yeah. And then how fast can you get them an estimate? Right. In my experiments, on the spot estimate is kind of shock and awe. Mm -hmm. I print it off, I walk in and it's like, it's unsurprised. They probably don't see any more value in that than emailing it 17 hours later. Mm -hmm. So I've done the experiments too, where I've taken two weeks of estimates and I've done my tablet and I said, you know what, would it be okay if I email this to you before I leave the office tomorrow? And every time before 5.30 in the morning, people have the entire packet in there. My closing rate is the same. Client satisfaction the same. I didn't find any statistical anomalies in that to prove that my paper estimate was like twice as good. Like yeah. because I was there, I still walk people through it, but I just emailed it the next day. And that lets you, I mean, it's small data size. If I did it to all millennials, they may all prefer, they may not want a paper estimate in there, but just email it to me, man. Yeah. Or at least do both. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah, so and, and I when I do my paper estimate, I should say I do both. But these are I'll just email you later. I didn't find any like reason to do so honestly, I think there's a threshold of you don't need to do 23 minute estimates with a paper copy in their hands. I think right now the easiest thing we can do is to get them the email within 24 hours. Yep. And you're still outperforming 99% of contractors. Mm -hmm. You know, even if you were to take 48 hours, you'd be before outperforming 99% of contractors. Well, and to communicate it, set the expectations, right? <laughs> exactly. and, and that's where it's like, people are willing to say, yeah, you can email it. Most, some people suggest it, so you can just yeah. email it to me and say, well, I'd rather give it to you in person. And I, I feel that tension and say, oh, well, you know what? It's like, okay, I'll get it to you by the end of the day. Yep. Yep. Um, and then do that. Just do what oh, you're going to yeah, say. Exactly. That's, yeah, probably if you said you were going to get one back four days from now and you did, I think that would probably be just as valuable as right. 24 hours. Almost more so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Say, I'm going to exactly. do this several days from now. Yeah. Have you, uh, have you experimented with pricing on your website at all or anything like that? I've been toying around with this idea of commoditizing a bedroom repaint. Mm -hmm. Um, and basically just say for this price, you're going to have to pick a color. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We can't line up a color consultation for you because the, it, the, um, the velocity of the interaction needs to happen very quick. And we can promise you within, you know, the, the idea would be the thought experiment would be within three days, you type in the dimensions of your room, you type in the color and I can get a painter guaranteed white glove, clean furniture, move, don't touch your room. In one day, we'll turn it around for you. I've not seen any other good examples of that. Mm -hmm. People have tried. It, and it, it's not because they're failures. It's because I don't know if the market was caught up yet. Sure. I yeah. think it's going to be there. Yeah. I really think it's going to be there. Now, general pricing overall, the only problem with that, it doesn't, it doesn't really move the interaction ahead. When people say cabinet painting is between $2,000 and $4,000, the client will say, that's great. Come over here and tell me what mine is. Yeah, yeah. So it doesn't really like, it may, it may turn, some, turn some people away that you don't know about. The problem is I want to interact with those people. Mm -hmm. You know, I would much rather have them fill out a lead form on my website. So now I have a lead and an email address and a, a, a marketing thing of saying, where did you hear from me? So even if they were never going to pay, like they're like, oh, I can get Annie Sloan chalk paint for 30 bucks and do it myself on the weekend. I just got marketing data from that because they have to list where they heard from me. So mm -hmm. I want them to interact with me. So I don't do the pricing thing mm -hmm. only because of that. I don't want to not know that people look at it and turn away. Right. I would rather have the interaction and tell them. And then I have a data point. Yeah. You know? That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. But I still love the idea of the Amazon. There's a yellow button in the corner of Nick's website. If you click this, you will get a room painted in three days. Yeah, yeah. I like that idea. I don't, yeah, I like well, the idea. And it, it kind of, uh, I mean, to bring up a, a interesting topic, right? It sounds like the paint sun and paint kind of what PCG is doing. And um, I think too, something with that, um, I've, I've been loosely following the, yeah, that. Yeah, me too. And, and I just, it's really interesting to me and my thoughts on it, just because I have a platform right now, yeah. is, um, the outburst against it is kind of interesting to me. And I think it's a scarcity mindset um, because in my mind, great, PPG wants to yeah. be a contractor. Well, you know what? They're employing a whole lot of people. Um, are they a competitor now? Um, well, 
maybe. But you know, if if every one of those jobs were yours, then you could say, yeah, maybe. Right. I mean, is but, it really going to impact and drive down your yeah. business? Plus, they're not exactly everywhere at the moment, and are they going to you know, monopolize the industry? Well, no. It is, and 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 what you say, I love your fresh perspective on this because you don't come from the mire of painters right. and my father was one i was one i was one of these bad painters from the outset if somebody said hey man have you ever tried this brush i'd be like <laughs> even if it is better no yeah my brush is the best why would i what do you know you know mm -hmm. same thing about this everybody's knee jerk is this is the devil mm -hmm. um most of the people with the biggest outcry don't even have a ppg store near them right so you're they're not taking money from you. You're not a commercial contractor and you don't base your business off PPG. So this is interesting. I remember Paint Zen. I think I've been following this along for a lot of years. And I remember Paint Zen when it was, I think it was a little more touchy feely where it was type in the inside of your beautiful home. It was more tailored towards like yeah. designers, clients, mm -hmm. things like that. I think they realized the complexity and the variables of interior <laughs> residential repaints yeah. the complexities of personality types and things and it's hard to commoditize and i think that's why they probably eventually went to the pure commercial thing because it is there's no irrational homeowners there and there's no special request there's no dogs and cats to deal with. <laughs> so you can understand why they're doing it i posited the question long ago Contractors spend a lot of money on marketing. Mm -hmm. You know, like mm -hmm. I think we spent three or four percent last year, which was a huge win. Industry standard, seven to seven and a half percent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know contractors who spend 10 to 20 percent on yeah. marketing. What mainly to fill a winter here in Minnesota? What if there was a lead source where you didn't have to market that would fill up that 30 percent of winter that's hard to fill? Is that necessarily the devil? Right. You know, it's, it's, I like, I like your thought of it. It's probably nothing I will ever do or use, but I will not bash it on the outset just cool. because of that. And to, to think too, you know, is that a competitor? Well, look like to your point, the Amazon effect, we're competing against Amazon. Yeah. Not just each other, not paint yeah. center. You know, You're not competing machines. against a uh, chuck and a truck down there. Yeah. The proverbial chuck and a truck. You guys don't know that you're competing against Amazon and McDonald's. I mean, yeah, it's everything. <laughs> you can get a delicious hamburger and the best fries on the planet for three dollars dollars <laughs> for nothing. And I mean, and right then, the exact same way, every single time. Monetized. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And also anywhere. Anywhere. You yeah. know, start reliable. Yeah. It's just it's just all over the place. And so when, with I think with that mentality to say realistically, is this going to impact our business model that much? Well maybe yeah but probably not um, well and if, if it was going to impact anybody be you hmm. for what you're gonna i mean there's, right. there's yeah. your, your model is way closer or your clients are way closer to that than you yeah. but i think it's it's always you can you can approach this two ways you can get your sword out and start walking towards paint set or you can be like tell me more yeah. like you don't have to make a decision just tell me more mm -hmm. let's learn together let's yeah. try it let's experiment yeah. let's yeah and i bet that uh the people leading that at PPG are not out to uh, ruin every painting contractor in the. Well, listen, there. I mean, I, I give people a lot of credit because normally the first, the beta version of something is always crappy and clunky. Right. Maybe this is that. Right. Maybe it's not. Maybe maybe this is the Amazon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and maybe we have something to learn from. Yeah. And maybe it works. And maybe yeah. they figure it out. Maybe there's something to learn from, and it's going to change the yeah. the face of contracting, and that might be a good thing. And you know what, there's a lot of, uh, what interested me is that, you know, obviously they're in the commercial world and there's a lot of large projects. People think large projects, but you know, there's a lot of painters that I know from around the area here that do insanely well with painting cell phone stores at night mm -hmm. because these people can't find anybody they trust. And when they find somebody they trust, they give them a list of 13 more stores. And the pay is two to four times higher than when you paint Elsie's bedroom mm -hmm. because you're going in at night and they don't want to deal with you. Like we can trust this guy. Who cares? He'll do it in the middle of the night. And you just made four times the industry standard on that. Yep. So you are not thinking about painting Bass Pro shops all the time. Mm -hmm. It might be an accent wall in a Verizon wireless store. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> and to that point too, um, last Friday I was at a lead paint. Uh, certification and then oh, I look at my I'm email. Sorry. <laughs> oh no, it, it was great. The guy was fantastic. Uh, I would. Who'd you use, by the way? Um, there was Zoda Pro. That's what. 
the only good people yeah. I've ever interacted with in the industry. There are crooks littering mm. this training industry. Zoda Pro was like, ah. So we got the owner because their Minnesota instructor no just kind of, I, I think he just <laughs> went a different direction. One of their other guys was hurt. So we got uh, we got Bob, nice. who was phenomenal. So oh, you need to do, awesome, he was so much fun. Um, okay. I highly recommend uh, Zoda Pro and getting out there soon because I bet Bob's going to do it. So oh, man, I love it. <laughs> yeah, but they've got instructors all over the country too. Um, so that's great. But anyway, I was sitting there and then all of a sudden I look at my email and the headline from PCA is, huge money to be made in lead paint. And I thought, this is incredibly insightful. Yeah. And so- Who's um, listening? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so you guys are watching me, but yeah. um, you know, I was talking about Memphis. There are 10, 10 lead paint certified firms in Memphis, 10. And it's, I think they said, um, I, I think it was Memphis at least, where it was 25 to 50% higher uh, lead poisoning rates for kids. Wow. And just and sitting in there in that class and thinking, I was like, I didn't know about this. We should have done things. Some, we should have done some things differently. And I hope nobody got hurt. Um, but this is an opportunity also. If you're willing to do things a little bit differently, yeah. pursue the, I mean, I, I literally, my wife and I are talking about say, we could open a branch in Memphis and just do lead paint. We could we could work in Minneapolis and just do lead paint. Absolutely. Um, if, if you, yeah, so doing the things that people can't do or won't do, right. it takes a little more thought, a little more skill. Exactly. But yeah, you'll roll that up. There's a lot of people who are, the, the chatter on the internet is screw these old houses. Mm -hmm. I'm so sick of dealing with the paperwork and this mm -hmm. and that. Good. Yeah. Good. Because there's people out there who don't mind paperwork. It's opportunity. You know? <laughs> and, you know, for all of us to talk about elevating the industry, painting is a low barrier to entry, which is beautiful because <laughs> here I am. Yeah. I mean, really, I'm, I'm almost almost nothing in the way and saying no startup costs, low, <laughs> low startup costs. Um, I don't even have to know about painting at the outset no. as long as I have the right partners and the right trust built, yeah. which some people don't like that I'm in the business and hopefully they can see that I'm actually hoping to learn the trade and respect the, old, the trade. Yeah. That again, yeah. That, that's my father's generation. Yeah. That's and, okay. and that's okay. And so, you know, but at this point it's saying there is a low barrier to entry. If you want to change your competition, specialize, do the nighttime stores at Verizon, do some epoxy yep. floor, be the special mm -hmm. forces of this industry. Right. They're at the hardest missions, right. the toughest stuff. And you know what? If you don't mind putting in the extra effort, there's a big reward. Oh, and you get paid it for it. You can yeah. make an $18 million industrial company. Oh, man. Yeah. Why not? That's the way to go, man. I mean, and so I, I just think we got on a, on a, yeah. a rabbit trail there, but I think it was fun. So, <laughs> so um, let me see. I think I got, man, I think I got just everything. Well, you so, look over your list. Let me run through with these. Uh, yeah. Phil Klein, uh, one of our great painter friends from uh, Iowa, who's actually been to the Gathering of Minnesota Painters. Uh, we just rolled out a 52 week challenge to help our guys uh, save money. Uh, its goal is that all our guys have said they wanted to do is save. Yeah, so he's actually being intentional. Mm, that's great. Um, Derek, uh, I'm seeing a trend of companies eliminating THC from their testing list and insurance requirements. Small step. Yep. Uh, I mean, it's people are, if it's legal, it's legal, you know, uh, shameful how much of those things are common sense and should be second nature to decent human beings. As you said, many of these simple things uh, above the average clients. Mm -hmm. um, ah, what are your favorite interior products for wall ceiling and trim? Do you have any, do you have any go-tos We have, you, uh, you use regularly? Yeah, now? we especially, um, the emerald urethane oh, yep. enamel is phenomenal. And so I, uh, when we were sitting down with my pricing at the beginning of the year, I said, I want that to be a dollar more expensive than Pro Classic. Uh, <laughs> so, yep, yep. so we got so it's, a, it's not even, so I go now and I'm talking to clients and say it's a no-brainer. Yes, um, we exactly. get the best stuff for um, yeah. so that stuff's phenomenal. I I love duration. Um, yeah. I duration is in Sherwood Williams we use almost exclusively yeah. um, and we get treated very well. Um, but I'd say duration is a really helpful thing because it, it's it's very easy to um, get the client on board with yeah. to explain to say you know what this is a higher quality. Is there that much difference between duration and emerald? Yeah, maybe. Um, but is it enough to justify nothing you choice? would ever feel or touch right. or whatever? Yeah. Right. So unless you're a very particular person, emerald's probably not your go-to. But duration's going to take care of you. And yep. so that, to me, has made a lot of sense. It's a high-quality product, and you can deliver a great, uh, great service, and guys like it. Agreed. Agreed. Same thing. Um, CHB for ceilings. Mm -hmm. One of the most magical projects on earth. Duration <laughs> for walls, duration mat. We love our duration mat. Mm -hmm. Seems to uh, click a lot of things with our clients. Uh, either emerald trim urethane or Benjamin more advanced uh, for all the trim and cabinets. And yeah, just simple processes, foolproof, bomb proof, 
apprentice proof. Yep. You know? yep. It's yep. good stuff reliable and it's not going anywhere either. It's not a, you know, I made the, I made the mistake years ago of, of liking oil varnish and you find your favorite oil varnish and those are going away. Mm -hmm. Every 18 mm -hmm. months you lose your favorite oil varnish and mm -hmm. you got to experiment with another. So these aren't going anywhere, <laughs> yeah. which is nice. So. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Let's take that one down. Okay. What else you got, man? I think the only other thing I've got is, uh, you know, <clears throat> just from my perspective, we're getting started and we're rolling along. And I know you've said you're encouraging that we're out talking to people, but from a practical standpoint within your business, what do you wish you had known um, at the beginning from like a, a tangible business practice um, or production practice? What do you wish you had known when you were starting? I'm going to pull this up because I, I had a, a screen share ready to go. Because 2020 is the year of mastering oh, yeah. yep. the basics. Yep. So I wish I would have known what gross profit is. Mm -hmm. I wish I would have known about industry benchmarks. So I'm going to pop this up. This isn't going to be quite intuitive because we're going to lose the screen, but we'll get to see this. I wish, well, come on now. I wish that one human would have shown me this. Yeah. 13 years ago when I started my business. You posted is, a picture of this and I, I typed it into Excel from the picture because I said, this is so good. So, yeah. Oh man, listen, I, I love the grit, although I email it to anybody who wants it. So. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> no, but uh, I wish somebody would have said, hey Nick, the two most important things in your life for the next foreseeable future is gonna be 15% material, 40% labor. Mm -hmm. So when you're a single person painting company, it's gonna be different. Yep. You, know, you don't have a set labor cost for yourself. When you have a few employees, it's still going to be a little different. But when you have a real business, it's going to be your life. And you're going to have to make very important decisions on it. 15% material, 40% labor. I put in 5% field management. Mm -hmm. Minus that out of 100, and hopefully you get 40% gross profit. I don't worry about overhead right now because I control it all. And mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a miser. <laughs> There's like This is a low overhead company. Not an issue now. It will be in the future. But... You do that, you, I focus all my time on material and labor and mainly labor because labor makes up 40% of all your costs. Mm -hmm. Well, not 40% of your costs, it's 40% based on your revenue. It's probably 60% of all your costs in a business. Sure. Who cares about paint? Like <laughs> if you, the, the thought experiment goes, there's a lot of dudes who think they're going to beat up their Sherwin rep and then be profitable. If you get all the Sherwin stuff for half the price as everybody else, which would be I mean, somebody from corporate would show up at your house. Yeah. You know, yeah. if you did that, congratulations, you just gained seven percent of revenue. Mm -hmm. It's never going to happen. Mm -hmm. Good luck. If you can somehow, if you can somehow get your people to move ten to thirty percent faster, you have just taken your labor costs down ten to twenty points yeah. easily. I focus all my time on labor. We don't have overhead. My production managers now take care of materials and they're consistently low in the 12s. So now all I do is focus on labor. Margin is made in labor. And because of all that, you shoot for that 20% net margin. That's a high one. 15% mm -hmm. is, is used as an industry benchmark. Although when I talk to painters, I don't know many painters who actually get a true 15 net, mm -hmm. you know, when you take out owner's pay. So I wish somebody would have given me this. Yeah. I also would have shown, I wish somebody would have shown me how to make a job budget. Mm -hmm. which is sort of the theme of today, which is people always say, how much time should, should something take you? And it, then you always have to ask, well, what's your production rates? What's your experience? Well, if you've never collected that data, you have to come up with something. Right. So I, I do a back end sort of thing. This can help in estimating. This can help with all of job costing. I do a back end way where you say, okay, let's say we're going to paint the outside of a house for 57 75 what we do to try to figure out how many hours my painters are going to take it is we minus materials because we don't want to we don't want to take that 5700 bucks and divide it by some hourly rate because yeah. there's materials in there that's yeah. not revenue producing so we're going to go equals this times 15%. So 15% is our materials we're going to minus the 15% off and that will give us that's how much paint theoretically we're going to aim to shoot for on this project. Mm -hmm. The industry benchmark, again, back to benchmarks, is $55 of revenue an hour. So now we say, okay, we take paint out of that, and now we want to see, if we use our industry benchmark, we're going to see how many hours this project should take. So, so we're going to go here. We're going to go this 
minus. You're not in a formula yet. This. Oops, sorry. <laughs> oh man, yeah, type in one hand. This is not great. Let's back out of this. Sorry, this is going to be clunky here. All right. Equals. We're going to take our revenue minus our materials. Not one of those. And then we divide. If we want to make 55 bucks an hour, we divide by 55 bucks an hour. And that is not going to be a percent. We need a number. <laughs> we should have 89 hours into this job, 89.25 hours. So if you want to know what a good benchmark is, uh, this is this is slushy. Like it's not going to be perfect. If you hit 89 hours, this isn't going to be 20% net at the end of the year. This is just a good saying. If we want to be at least industry average, let's try to keep paint to 866 bucks and let's try to finish in 89 hours. And if you do that, you have a very good chance of hitting a high net profit at the end of the year. And the 89 hours is total man hours. Total man hours. This is two 45 hour weeks yep. for guys. So yeah, that's basically, yeah, we'll get rid of this thing here. So that was, that was again, uh, continuing with, uh, um, the sort of through line through 2020 is mastering the basics and doing that. How do you know how long something's going to take you? That, yep. that can also aid you in your estimating. Your, what do we charge for something? Those two things will kind of tell you what mm -hmm. to charge for something. You can back end that equation through there. So um, yeah, that's what I wish somebody would have told me. No, that's great. It, it's, you know, it's, it's wonderful because we, in looking at what we did last year, um, you know, we finished the year and said, well, this wasn't exactly what we hoped it'd be when we started, but it was year one. We learned a ton. We're in a decent position now, um, especially when we're looking at the numbers saying, this doesn't look too encouraging to say, it changed through the year. And especially at the yes. beginning of the year, yes. yep. we were overpaying on labor and materials. Uh, we ended up with 60% labor burden and uh, big and then 20% material. Because we, in particular, um, the partner we paid the most with last year, which we only worked with for a month or two, mm. but overbought materials and yes. charge extra. And I was just inexperienced. I didn't realize yep. we should yep. probably be doing this a little bit differently. And so corrected that um, and just didn't have the volume to tight, tight control from the start. We'll make sure yep. that you're not trying to make up in the end. So yep. uh, like I was talking with the Turies this morning, we spent many hours talking about this and I don't focus on the analytics. The analytics tell you what you've done. I focus on garbage in garbage out which is i'm going to get out there and train my people i know that human to human interaction is going to make sure that labor goes as low as possible mm -hmm. i'm going to check in we're going to talk with them we're going to inspect the jobs then the numbers will reflect that right. a lot of people right. just say come on i need some numbers so i can make a decision you know what to do yeah it's not satisfying just go do it and right. magically your numbers will fall on the line too right. so <laughs> right. all right man what else you got oh that's all you, you yeah. that's it holding man. you to your commitments as well. i'm under that's budget it. <laughs> I'm under budget today. So this has been awesome, man. Adam, thank you for coming down here. This has been great. This isn't the last time I assume we're ever going to do this. Yeah. I think we'll reverse this next time. And uh, I want to hear how this year goes for you. So we may turn the table next time and do this. So. Well, hopefully we've got good news. So. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> or we can get out the benchmarks and, and yeah. problem solve. So yeah, either way, it's fun either well. way. So, Absolutely. Um, so yeah, uh, Adam is indicative of sort of the new breed of tradespeople out there who uh, are not mired in the sort of history that a lot of us are. And it brings a fresh perspective and they're doing, you know, in year one, sometimes in year minus one, what some of us are doing in year 30. So it's a, it's an interesting perspective. And if you don't think this is going to change, <laughs> you're going to be going up against this guy in paint Zen. So, <laughs> so good luck. So, uh, all right. Uh, look for Adam on uh, social media, on Facebook. And thank you all for watching. I uh, love doing this and have a great week. Thanks a lot. Big thanks to Nick as well. Appreciate it. You guys are the best.